Good morning, and welcome to 3D Vision Technologies monthly 10-4 Tech Talk, a monthly review of technology that can make you better, faster, and smarter. I'm Todd Majewski, your host. Today's presentation is on tooling with Stratasys 3D printing. Our presenter is Jeremy Marvin, application engineer for 3D Vision Technologies. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Todd. Jeremy, I would like to tell our audience a little bit of your background. Now, you worked for a manufacturer as a product designer and process engineer. So I'm kind of guessing that you know what our audience goes through on a daily basis. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've been there. I've been where they're at. You know, I've designed machines. I've been there. I've felt that. And I've uh, felt the pain that our customers feel. Well, so that definitely tells me that you're well qualified for this presentation. So, Jeremy, tell us just a little bit of what we, the listeners can expect to see today. So we're going to take a, a brief look at how uh, a few customers are replacing their traditionally manufactured tooling with 3D printing components. Fantastic. So let's just get right into it. Why don't you start our presentation? All right. Good morning again, again everyone. Um, this is going to be a, a quick presentation on FDM tooling, as Todd had mentioned. So just a quick overview, uh, an agenda, if you will, of our presentation. We're going to talk about the application in general, just a quick overview of what it is. And uh, then we'll do a process comparison. We'll talk about the, the traditionally manufactured parts, uh, going through those steps of making a part uh, traditionally. And then we'll go through that same process with the FDM uh, process, 3D printing those. And we'll see some benefits at the end. We'll see some benefits of printing those parts. How, you know, what are we getting out of this? Our customers are saving time, they're saving money. And then uh, some customer stories to tie all together. So just a quick question before we get too much. Uh, is what is your average lead time uh, when tooling up with a new product? Uh, so just, you know, not the entire assembly line, but maybe one work cell. Um, are we talking days? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? Or if you're in maybe the automotive and it's a couple years, uh, let's take a look. Um, you know, usually we're seeing people in the, uh, the weeks, the months, but let's take a look at what our customers are doing in this presentation today. Uh, so in the weeks, the months, it's exactly what we were thinking. Um, I'm glad we don't see any years in there. Um, makes me feel better that we're able to chew up a lot faster around here. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see that we're not into days because people are just going to lie about it. <laughs> So let's get into the application overview. Uh, so tooling, when we talk about tooling and manufacturing, a tool is a part used in the production of another part. Um, we have uh, here a picture of a traditionally manufactured tooling. Uh, and if you can look at here, you can see there's bolts in there. They're, they're bolted together. We have some store-bought components with the cylinder there. Uh, I see some washers. Um, you know, this is a, a very complex part. And we'll talk about Genesis, the, the manufacturer of this part, later on. Okay. So what other different types of toolings are out there? Uh, blow molding uh, is a good example of those pot bottles uh, on the plastic cups that you have on your desk. End of arm tooling, which was what we saw in the previous slide. Hydroforming, uh, injection molding, uh, investment casting, different types of silicon molds. Uh, fiber molding, sand casting, spin casting, soluble cores which is uh, as a way to create a form around a, a part and we, we, um, the part is dissolved away with a solution or a chemical later on, and, and thermal forming. And for the remainder of this presentation, we're going to focus mainly on end of arm tooling and soluble cores. Now, I, I chose these because these are two of my favorite ones. The soluble cores is, is very, very cool. Uh, we'll see some examples of that, and we'll, we'll also see some samples of the end of arm tooling. So who uses tooling? Basically, any manufacturer that makes a part is going to be using tooling. Um, aerospace, we see a huge in automotive. The Marines uh, in the brain area. Robotic system integrators, performance sports, uh, medical prosthetics, and orthotics. You know, again, manufacturers, custom molders, and even foundries. So another quick question. Uh, how is your tooling currently being made? Uh, traditional manufacturing, you know, CNC or otherwise, uh, maybe you're already 3D printing some of your tooling. Uh, made by hand, 
uh, or maybe you're just here for some knowledge growth on 3D printing industry and you don't manufacture anything. Um, now, I have made my hand up here uh, because I've actually been in two customers in the last year where um, there was a guy making a pattern by hand. He was carving this out of wood. So let's take a look. Uh, traditional CNC's and uh, actually quite a few people 3D printing, so uh, that's great. Uh, traditional CNC is what we see for the most part that don't have 3D printing yet. This is how the parts are made, uh, and we hit that nail around. All right, so let's go into that process comparison. We'll go through the traditional process, uh, the process that you guys are going through right now that are actually using CNC. Uh, and that starts in the engineering department. Uh, so you're doing some sort of CAD drawing. Uh, with 3D printing, we're going to need to take it from you know, 2D. We're going to need that 3D model. But for the most part, nowadays, most people are doing 3D CAD. So from that 3D CAD data, we're generating 2D models. Uh, once that drawing packet is released to the manufacturing floor, um, they're getting assigned the work orders or, or the travelers. Uh, do we have that material in stock? Uh, let's order the material that we don't have in stock. Or we don't stock this material. Let's go back to engineering and redesign it because we don't carry that. Uh, you know, you name it. Uh, from there, we send it out and it actually gets machined. Uh, CNC'd, or manual machining, uh, or made by hand as we mentioned before. Uh, so the, the handmade, the CNC, the manual, any time you make a change, it goes back to the beginning, back to the drawing board, where we make a revision. Uh, we send it back out to get started over, and, and maybe uh, you can carve out those those uh, bad areas and uh, maybe put in a little plug to replace those. It requires skill labor. It increases cost and time for any any minor change. Right. So from there, all of those parts get out to the assembly area where they're assembled. And either, um, so we're talking about end of arm tooling where they're installed on that robot for its final use, um, or we're talking about soluble cores and it's going somewhere else. Uh, traditionally, soluble cores are a clamshell design where you have a shape hollowed out and you lay in the carbon fiber and um, uh, set it and then bolt it together. So there's always a seam to worry about. Okay, so let's go through the FDM process. Now we still need 3D CAD. We still need the STL model. Every 3D printer out there uses currently uses that STL file, so we need that 3D CAD data. SolidWorks is a great tool for that. Uh, if you guys are still using 2D, 2D uh, give us a call and we'll help you with SolidWorks. All right. So the FDM process we have uh, in all of our FDM machines, we have two extrusion tips. We have a model material and we have a support material that we will heat up, we'll extrude out layer by layer. Um, the head moves in the X and the Y direction, and then the platen, uh, the build plate that we're building on moves in the Z, it moves down in the Z for every layer. And you can kind of see we have a light blue and a darker blue. Now the darker blue represents the support material. Any overhang, you know, a straight through overhang will require that support material. And that support material is what we'll use later on for our soluble cores. And you'll see that we can almost cheat this. We can cheat gravity sometimes. We'll, if it's at a 45, 50 degree angle, we don't necessarily need that support structure. So what are we extruding? Well, just different types of uh, thermoplastics. On our chart here, uh, as we move to the right and up, the chemical, mechanical, and thermal properties increase. All right, so where we want to be at for soluble cores is on the left-hand side because we want our material to dissolve away uh, very, very quickly when our, when our parts are set. All right? So we use uh, plastics called SR100, 110, and SR30, and they have some different properties that we would use one over the other. Um, for the uh, end of arm tooling, we would use ABS plastics, polycarbonates, nylons, and even up to Altum, which we'll see in our customer story. And we have a, a little link uh, over on the right-hand side of your screen to download. It's a material spec sheet for all FDM materials that are currently available. Uh, this was just uh, updated within the last couple weeks as uh, Altum 1010 came out on the market. It's the highest tensile strength uh, FDM material that we have available today. Okay. So 
let's get into the benefits of replacing. You remember that, uh, that monstrous assembly that was in the beginning? If you look here on the right, and I can't quite tell if this is in use or not. I don't see any water spraying everywhere, but this is the, the end of arm tooling for uh, a manufacturer to do water jet cutting. And we'll get into this a little bit more later on, but it's holding a part and it's, it's moving the part through the water jet. Uh, so we see an average lead time reduction for using 3D printing, uh, 75, 70 to 85%, and a cost reduction of 75 to 85% as well. Okay. We also get greater design freedom. All right. we're, we're not designing for manufacturing anymore. We're tubings, uh, all the external tubing and hoses that we would have, we can put those internal. Uh, we can consolidate assembly. I mean, this is one part now as opposed to that uh, multiple parts with all the fasteners. We, we, can, we can incorporate complex organic shapes and, and integrate components. You know, maybe we need a nut in read or, a, or maybe an RFID chip, and we can embed that into our models today. Okay. We're reducing weight. Um, you know, end of arm tooling, if you have a giant robot moving and swinging this end of arm tooling around, anytime we're reducing weight, we're, we're increasing the, the, the useful life of our robots. Uh, we can increase velocity where, and dampen the impacts. The plastics are non-marring, so we don't have to worry about scratching uh, the parts on the end. Some size limitations is basically we're limited to the size of our build envelope on our printer. Uh, and our biggest printer available in FDM is uh, 24 by 36 by 36, I believe. Um, quantities, you know, one off to you know, a couple hundred. Uh, we're not going to mass produce these tooling bits, uh, and it'll be a long time before we're able to do that. Uh, again, the, the design freedom, you know, complex organic shapes, making things lightweight, using the, the benefits of printing, making uh, parts honeycomb or, or sparse fill in areas where they can be sparse fill, and strengthening areas that need to be super strong by making those solid. And then um, the material properties has to be acceptable to you and the, the tolerances of about plus or minus five thou uh, needs to be acceptable as well. Now we have some materials that can be tighter than that, but it shouldn't be any more than five thou. Hey Jeremy, can I ask you a question? You said uh, mass producing, uh, it won't mass produce, but if you're only doing low quantities, then certainly it's a perfect fit. When does it become that part where you say, okay, I need to make metal tooling over just doing plastic parts? Um, that's where you take the, the number of shots you can get out of the printed part and the number of shots you can get out of the metal parts and do your averaging out. Uh, eventually the plastic is going to wear out, you have to replace it, but generally the, the printed part is cheaper, it's just how many times you have to replace it during the life of your end product. Right, so in the thousands it sounds very doable, but maybe the tens or hundreds of thousands, you really got to start looking at traditional methods. Um, well, tens to hundreds, I would say, is still for, in the range of 3D printing. Mm -hmm. That's when we get up into the thousands where we're going to go back to traditional. Okay. So, all right, so some benefits, uh, FDM benefits on the soluble cores. So we mentioned that soluble cores is where we're actually printing in that soluble support material. You know, with our Fortis machines, we can dictate to the machine to actually print in that material. So we'll print out a shape and we'll wrap it with uh, carbon fiber um, that's put into a, an oven basically to set up, and then we dissolve that later out. And you can kind of see uh, the picture on the right, on the upper right, uh, we have the, the soluble core, so that was printed part, and then the, the tubing that was produced from that above that. And then down below you can kind of see how a guy is just starting to uh, wrap the carbon fiber. Uh, it's like a, a and then they'll, they'll uh, brush on the epoxy, they'll vacuum it, and then they make it to set. Okay. With soluble cores, we're seeing a, a lead time reduction of 50 to 85 percent and cost savings of up to 95 percent. Uh, so there's less tooling, less setup, no bonding of the sections. So remember, previously we would see this as a clamshell design where you got two open halves um, and you have to bond that together somehow, either bolting it or using some more epoxy. This makes it a single piece construction. We can put more features in, integrate more hardware, like we said with the other one. Uh, and control surface finish and accuracy. So when we have that clamshell design, we have a seam down the side, but we can get rid of that seam. We can make parts more complex. 
uh, replace the core manual production methods almost completely. Right. So the quantities are very similar to the other. We're going to be in the, the ones to 100s. Uh, but our parts are going to be seamless. They're going to be wrinkle free, which might not be the case with the other side. And we're going to have a good internal surface finish. So some things to consider for our soluble cores, 3D printed soluble cores, is that curing temperature. Um, we can have an initial curing temperature of up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's if we use the SR100 uh, we can see as high as 200 degrees Fahrenheit with the SR30. So that's where we need to kind of look at our process to figure out what material to use. Now, after that initial cure and we dissolve out that uh, soluble support, we can go back into the oven and cure at a higher temperature if we need to. And then a consolidation pressure of up to 80 psi. So who is using this? Uh, we've already mentioned Genesis Systems for the end of arm tooling. We've seen uh, some pictures from Champion Motorsports, and we'll get into those two customers here in a little bit. Joe Gibbs Racing is a pretty big NASCAR. Uh, Austin Martin, a manufacturer of some pretty nice automobiles, I, I understand. Uh, NASA, I mean, we're, we're sending 3D printed parts into space, and, and even schools, uh, South Dakota School of Mines. We personally have a, a school that we work with uh, from time to time, um, Akron University and their Formula SA team, uh, the Akron Zips. That's awesome. So even engineering students are using uh, the soluble cores for building some of their products. Yes, yes. Um, and, and it's awesome. These, these kids are, are super smart. Uh, we, we had them visit us with us at a trade show recently, and they were using it to do several parts on their, on their carts, the race car that they were doing, and their entire body was out of carbon fiber, so it made it lightweight. They were able to take a, a very small motorcycle engine and really crank up the horsepower. Uh, and I, I think I heard it goes like zero to 60 in four I think minutes. it's under four seconds. Under four seconds, yeah. yeah it, it was pretty insane. A very, very cool story. All right, so we have uh, the customer stories that I promised you. Uh, this is uh, first story is on Champion Motorsports. Um, their big legacy uh, is a, a win at the 24-hour Le Mans and then five straight American Le Mans Series LMPI championships. So they were a private company, and what they did is they proved their technology, that their, their aftermarket parts, basically. They proved them on the racetrack, and now they sell those aftermarket parts for uh, Porsche owners. So this is the Porsche 997 Turbo. And you can see here in this picture that this little duct work on the, the turbo duct work on the back, and if you guys can see that, uh, my cursor going along there. So that was replaced. That was the first thing that they work on. And by replacing that traditionally manufactured, um, you know, it's still a carbon fiber, the clamshell carbon fiber, they were able to increase the internal diameter and basically prove themselves on the racetrack, which to me is priceless. So we have that uh, the intake there on the left. You have the soluble core. Uh, that core didn't go with that part now that I look at it. And then some other parts they started to take out of the or to replace inside the car. I mean, they, they found one use for it, and then they started expanding. And every part they replaced reduced the weight, which improved performance overall. So over on the right, you should see a, uh, a white paper, an application brief on soluble cores. Uh, it does have some extra information. It does repeat some of the benefits of FDM, and it has the, uh, the Champion Motorsports uh, story in there as well. Okay. You guys remember this picture? <laughs> this was the, the Genesis Systems group. And, and you think about they were doing robot integration. So they're not, they're not designing the end part. They're designing the robots or the cells that, that produce those parts. So they're... Um, headquartered in Davenport, Iowa, and they are, like I said, a systems uh, build and implement robotic automation systems. And one of their big ideas, their, their big claim to fame, is instead of moving the head on a giant gantry, and, and you know, customers will, will recognize a giant water jet, uh, it's a giant table, and instead of moving the head, moving the jet, is that they left the jet stationary, which made it a whole lot smaller, and then they, they moved the tooling. Right. Now, doing so, that made their tooling very expensive. In this case, this tooling, um, it was $8,000 to manufacture and weighed 
about 35 pounds. Uh, about 35 pounds, you can look at it and say, all right, that's that's fairly small. You know, it, it is a little small. But you know, when I look at that part, Jeremy, that thing's got weld beads on it. It's got machined parts on it. It's got drill holes, and there's time and labor in putting a lot of that thing together. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing multiple setups. I, I see bolt holes. I see a cylinder on there. I mean, you're going to have, uh, I can't tell if that's a hydraulic or a pneumatic cylinder. You're going to have tubing hanging all over the place. And what, what Genesis found out is that by moving their parts through the water jet, that that tubing, if that tubing came loose, it would get cut and they have to shut down and fix it. So uh, what they did is they, they reached out to Stratasys and they came up with this design. Uh, so this reduced that entire assembly, that $8,000 part, that 35-pound $8,000 part, and dropped it to uh, about three pounds in one part. All the exterior tubing was reduced uh, as well because we have a, a groove inside of here. So this opening here connects with internal passages here and here. And um, you can kind of see it here on the right that it's holding up a piece in the water jet. Now, you guys know the pressures in water jets were, were thousands and thousands of pounds, and that this FDM part is strong enough to take those pressures and continue to work. All right. Uh, so the CNC machined part uh, was 20 days to manufacture, weighed 35 pounds. The FDM part took three days to print, uh, and it was actually done at a 45 degree from that image right there, so that the flange was at the bottom. So those overhangs were self-supporting. We didn't really need any of the support structure inside of there. All right. That saved them 17 days of manufacturing time and 91% of the weight. That's an incredible story. Okay. So over on the right-hand side again, you'll see another download for an application brief. And then um, you'll see in there the, the Genesis tooling groups. You'll see their story, as well as the benefits of FDM. Right. We, we have one last question for you guys. Is what's holding your company back? What's your biggest obstacle for introducing 3D printing to your company? Um, upfront cost. The plastics aren't strong enough for your application. You know, we just we just had, had a, a new material release, so Awesome 1010 is able to replace a lot of uh, aluminum in the field as far as tensile strength. Uh, maybe you're worried about the learning curve or the time investment involved with installing and learning it and, and keeping it up and running. Or maybe your way, way works just fine. Why change? So we have a tie. Uh, plastics aren't strong enough. Um, so. I would definitely check out that spec sheet and just verify. Uh, and if you if you think we're close, you know, let us know and we'll help you out. And uh, the second runner-up was the upfront cost. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe I could address that. And that's always a an objection in, in many cases when you know when we're selling 3D printing. But what we found is a lot of clients are actually uh, having us print the parts for them first, which lowers that upfront cost. And then they're finding that this actually is working, and then we go through and help them justify how often would they print tooling, and then look at the total cost. But the, the big savings really is that time to get the tooling on the shop floor from days versus weeks. And a lot of times it's hard to put a dollar figure on the time when you're waiting for something, but uh, it, it is a huge investment. Uh, it could be a huge investment if you think about it, but the reality is um, people like Genesis have found that uh, they print so much tooling now that the cost is negligible. Absolutely. Okay. I wanted to bring up this last slide uh, as we're starting to wrap up here just to, to get your minds thinking about some of the applications out there that we're replacing with FDM. And I actually had to, to whittle down the list because I didn't have room on this page. Uh, and then, you know, these are some of my top ones. Uh, we've seen a lot of sand casting and uh, investment casting is going on right now uh, in our territory. I want to thank you for coming and giving a great presentation on how to use FDM printing for jigs and fixtures and, and tooling. So that was a very entertaining presentation. And also I want to thank the audience for uh, attending and we will be here next week or next month, excuse me, uh, in January. Look forward to our next 10-4 Tech Talk. 
Uh, because of the holidays, we actually got off our, our, our regular calendar, which is the fourth Thursday of every month. But uh, our next event will be in January, so look for emails and announcements on our website at uh, 3dvision.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.